This panel is entitled The Build-Up and the After Party, Comparing Mega Event Cities. And I just want to emphasize that uh, our four speakers are theater and performance studies scholars who think about cultural production. Um, and I want to emphasize that because so far in our gathering, we've had largely mixed uh, papers in terms of bringing cultural geographers together with performance studies scholars or uh, mm. programmers and artists beside people who are thinking about um, sport or um, indigenous issues in connection to sport, for example. And I think one of the benefits of having a kind of discipline-specific panel, is, uh, particularly within regards to theatre and performance studies, is that um, these scholars can move up close to the taken-for-granted uh, around some of the concepts within mega-event studies. So I think one of the primary taken-for-granteds is it's just a spectacle. It's just decoration slash ornamentation. It's just a feeling. So what Kelsey was trying to probe yesterday through thinking about men's hockey. And so they can really move up close, uh, right up close to that idea of it's just, and ask what we overlook when we frame art, performance, and culture um, in terms of that uh, distraction. So I'm just going to um, name our participants and their institutional affiliation. Our first paper this morning is Susan Bennett from the University of Calgary in the Department of English. And her paper is titled Performance Topographies and Olympic Cities, Calgary and After. Uh, then we'll be following with Jen Harvey, who's in the Drama Department at Queen Mary, University of London. And her paper is entitled The After Party, Montreal, Glasgow, London. And then um, we'll actually be moving a bit against the grain of what we've slotted into the um, program proper and be following with Sarah Thomason, who is also at uh, the drama department at Queen Mary University of London. And, she'll, and her paper is entitled Comparing the Festival Cities of Edinburgh and Adelaide, Methodological Considerations. And finally, we'll be ending with Kim Solga, who's at Western University, Department of English, and her paper is entitled Toronto's Pan Am, Toronto's Pan American Moment, Imagining the Arts in Advance of the Mega Event. So we'll begin with Susan. So first of all, thank you to Karen and to Peter and to Kirsty for organizing this really spectacular event. And thank you everyone for your work so far. It's been a really nourishing few days that I've very much enjoyed. So, so scholarly, scholarly inter interrogations of mega events have tended to focus on both intrinsic and instrumental attributes of event programming as well as their immediate impacts on audiences, on places, on representational trajectories, on local and national policy, and so on. Fewer studies, however, have assessed the aftermath of these large-scale and ambitious occasions over a longer horizon, beyond a particular interest in the economic outcomes. Famously, of course, the Olympic Stadium built for the 1976 Summer Olympics in Montreal was only fully paid for 30 years later and at a cost of $1.5 billion. Yet it's typical, perhaps obligatory, for those involved in the planning of a mega event to speak enthusiastically about its potential to generate a legacy. While the OED defines a legacy um, kind of vaguely, actually, as anything handed down by an ancestor, mega event rhetoric has come to promise a dizzying array of impacts for most localities. But however much may or may not happen to a site that has served as a host for a mega event, I suspect that in an ever-accelerated calendar of mega-events, attention, be that attention public, corporate, media, governmental, or international, soon turns its gaze to the next big thing, 
Brazil has barely waved off, waved off the thousands of soccer fans for the World Cup before the Olympics are on its horizon. 2015 will see the next major world exposition in Milan and uniquely twinned with the long-standing mega event, the Venice Biennale. 2016 offers not just the next Summer Games, but Shakespeare 400, that will have major cultural events, not just restricted to London and Stratford, but planned worldwide, and so it goes. So to turn my attention back to the 15th Winter Games in 1988 in Calgary is something akin to time travel, to an event before the mega prefix had become a normative, before a rhetoric of legacy was commonplace, before the International Paralympics Committee had signed an agreement with the IOC to stage their games in the same city and venues as the IOC games, before the Olympic rings were, as Wen Barney and Martin have so trenchantly put it, tarnished by the Salt Lake City scandal, and before the extraordinary personal fortunes had been amassed by individual members of IOC's corporate board. My paper retrieves the history of an ambitious arts festival made possible by the platform of the Games, so as to examine both the experience of that event and its importance for Calgary, artistic, cultural, and political concerns that have shaped what I'm calling here performance topographies. From an account of the general scope of the festival and its implication for local artists, and indeed the general and growing population in the city, I move to a particular case study drawn from the festival programming that illustrates the complexity we must attach to any idea of legacy and the interpretive frameworks in which that might be understood, both historically and geographically, and as contested space. By any measure, contemporary Calgary is very different from the place that staked a claim on the world map with the Winter Games. And this is a slide that was um, uh, put up by a Calgary real estate uh, agent uh, in 2013, which was the 25th anniversary of, uh, of the Games. And it's organized as um, five bubbles that are the colors of the Olympic rings. And it gives us kind of then and now comparisons. So, You'll see under population, it has doubled since, uh, since 1988, that the um, average gas price, which of course is what um, controls Calgary's economy as the price of gas, has also doubled, more than doubled since 1988. That housing starts have traveled uh, year over year. So in 1988, there were 3,900 housing starts, and in 2013, there were 12,000 housing starts. The, um, one of the bubbles is for buildings over 150 meters. In 1988, there were seven buildings over 150 meters. In 2013, there were 15, and I believe by next year, we're gonna be at 22. And in the final bubble, we see the two mayors. In 1988, the mayor of Calgary was Ralph Klein, who went on to be premier of Alberta, and famously um, disposed of, of Alberta's debt by making um, deep cuts to health and education, 24% over two years, and was um, incredibly proud of the fact that he became Premier of Alberta having only a grade 10 education. And in 2013, our Mayor is Nahid Nenchi, who had just been re-elected for his second term. He was, and I think remains, the only um, Muslim Mayor in North America and he was born in a largely South Asian suburb of Calgary, but has um, went on to do graduate work at Harvard in public policy, and is probably the most popular mayor on the planet, I think, and deservedly <laughs> so. He's absolutely wonderful. Anyway, I will argue that today's Calgary had its genesis in the experience in 1988 of being an Olympic city. So the 15th Winter Olympic Games ran from the 13th to the 28th of February, the first Winter Games to be held on Canadian soil and remembered in sports history as one where the host country failed to win a gold medal, finishing with a mere two silver and three bronze as a tally. But a crucial first for these Winter Games was the extension of the Games period from its usual 12 days to 16, which is something that the Calgary Olympic Committee negotiated, that allowed for an extra weekend which was a compelling addition in terms of media coverage and the potential for advertising. And for this reason, garnered a US television contract that earned the, the Calgary Olympic organizers a record payment of $306 million from NBC. 
The extra days were instrumental in the Games producing a significant profit, $66 million of which launched the, the Canadian Olympic Development Association Endowment, and these were the funds that were the foundation for what later became known as the Own the Podium program. Preceding the opening ceremonies by a full month, Calgary's Olympic Arts Festival ran from January 13th to February the 28th. Um, this is a copy of the Olympic Arts Festival program in a, in a lovely late 1980s aesthetic, which shows um, the, a four-man bobsled team um, apparently in action in a pink ballet slipper. So. Um, and the um, Arts Festival had, a, by today's standards, a tiny budget, $10 million, in an overall games cost that exceeded a $1 billion. Nonetheless, the festival offered more than 600 performances and exhibitions that were attended by more than half a million people. The provision of cultural programming is, as you know, a requirement of a host city's duties according to the IOC's Olympic Charter. Although Calgary's Arts Festival is genuinely, genuinely, agree, generally agreed to be the first of any sizable ambition. Rule 39, as um, Robert showed us yesterday, specifies that the organizing committee arrange, quote, a program of cultural events which must cover at least the entire period during which the Olympic Village is open. Such program shall be submitted to the IOC Executive Board for its prior approval, end quote. What the Charter doesn't specify is the degree of control exerted by the IOC. Calgary Festival Director Michael Tabbitt responded to local disappointment that so few international artists and companies were involved with the comment that it was the IOC's dictate that cultural events showcase the talent of the host country. Tabard also expressed his frustration that blocks of empty seats at otherwise sold out events came from, quote, the so-called members of the Olympic family, sponsors, games officials, politicians, and other VIPs, who had exercised their prerogative of snapping up large blocks of festival tickets prior to public sale, and then didn't bother to attend to the obvious detriment of local audiences. 2,200 artists from 18 different disciplines were involved in the festival. These included the Canadian premiere of Peter Brook's Carmen, the Shaw Festival's production of You Never Can Tell, the National Ballet of Canada, Marie Chouinard, La 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 Human Steps, the Joffrey Ballet, the National Arts Centre Orchestra, Toronto Symphony, Theatre Calgary's production of Sharon Pollock's Walsh, Robert Lepage's one-man show Vinci in French, Cirque du Soleil, the Alberta Theatre Project's first Playwrights Festival, a Writers' Festival, a Film Festival, a Folk Festival, various visual arts exhibitions and installations, among them um, the commission of a number of Olympic arches. And this is one of the arches that is um, still standing. It's by Canadian artists Tony Griffin and Francis Schmidt. And it's a rusted uh, metal arch that is being held up by four um, bronzes, androgynous-looking winter uh, Olympics athletes who are um, holding up the arch. It was originally outside City Hall during the Olympics and has since then been on several locations on the University of Calgary campus and is a very popular spot for convocation photographs. Um, you can imagine how you might pose with that. Susan Scott, writing in the Calgary Herald the day after the Games ended, suggested that the Arts Festival triumph should put to rest old Calgary jokes about the city as a cow town, although she herself complained that the program had lacked true international stars like the Royal Shakespeare Company or Pina Bausch. Emissions notwithstanding, Scott noted that the sale of 155,000 tickets to a population of 650,000 was an extraordinary accomplishment. A few details from the festival remind us that 1988 was indeed another time. The ticketed events had ranged in price from $4 to $40, the top end provoking expressions of outrage and astonishment by Calgary critics, although there were too um, a lot, lot of events that were free for the public. While gripes had been vociferous in many about not being able to get tickets for Peter Brook's Carmen or for the Joffrey Ballet or other prestige international performances, it was interesting that tickets for Cirque du Soleil, whose four performances closed the festival, were widely available, largely because no one yet knew who they were. And as among the, <laughs> amazing to think of, among the uh, company's first ventures outside of Quebec, 
and their show didn't even have a name at this stage. It was just Cirque du Soleil. And they didn't have much in the way of publicity materials that explained what their show was all about. So in 1988, local reviewers had struggled to explain what the Cirque show would be, and that the lead theatre critic in the city, Louis B. Hobson, came to the conclusion that it was a show that was like cats, exploding with unabashed theatrical brilliance. It's a well-orchestrated Broadway-style show, he said. Of course, as the company now boasts on its website, more than 100 million people have seen a Cirque du Soleil performance. <coughs> Calgary has become a regular stop for their touring shows and is rumored to have the highest percentage capacity seat sales anywhere in Canada. And the Cirque Nouveau aesthetic of Cirque du Soleil, it seems to me, has become a dominant reference point for almost every opening ceremony of a mega event for the past decade. If almost all of the festival events were a robust success, only one was cancelled, a rock concert that was to be headlined by Neil Young, but which uh, failed to sell enough advance tickets to make it viable. The festival pro proved to be to the detriment of Calgary's regular arts producers. To give you two quite different examples, Stage West, the city's long-running dinner theater, saw its season attendance drop from 96% capacity to 61% with an overall loss of 35% of their audience that year. The more experimental One Yellow Rabbit simply shut down during the Olympic period, although Blake Brooker, co-founder and at that time co-artistic director of the company, described the importance for OYR in establishing contacts with international giants like Brooke and Lepage. The Writers Festival migrated a few years later into Calgary's highly regarded WordFest. Bob White took a job at Alberta Theatre Projects because of the opportunity to run the new Playwrights Festival, an event that started with the Olympics but which became an annual six-week occasion that has taken place every year since 1988 and served, as Kelly Nustrak has put it, as a significant in incubator for new comedies and dramas in the country. Sadly, after 26 years and more than 100 new plays, two-thirds of which went on to be produced again in Canada, 2014 was the last year of playwrights. At the conclusion of the Games, hopes that an Olympic Arts Foundation might be created to match the opportunity being offered to the sports community and support cultural activities in the city were, however, dashed when OC, uh, OCO88, which was the local organizing committee, who had retained $15.5 million to disperse to local projects, rejected a $5 million request to establish an arts endowment. Since 1988, however, it has been frequently argued that the Olympics were Calgary's psychological coming of age, an opinion much touted last year on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the Games. In another paper, I've detailed at length the development of built environment, including cultural infrastructure, as the realization of aspirations produced by the city's Olympic success. But suffice to say here that the festival inspired artists and audiences alike to see the arts probably for the first time, as crucial to the imagination and understanding of what the city was and what it might be. It was, for a city of modest size, a game changer and a spur to expectations that Calgary should have and recognize an art scene. I've deliberately admitted so far from my somewhat celebratory account of the Olympic Arts Festival, the controversial Glenbow Museum exhibition, The Spirit Sings. And this is an image of the um, exhibition catalog, which is of uh, a First Nations mask. It was one of the best attended events in the festival and garnered national and international coverage. And I want to argue here that its legacy has in many ways far exceeded either the Olympic Games themselves or the Contextual Arts Festival of which it was a part. And that this is a legacy which continues to be felt across artistic, cultural and political domains. As Rebecca Nelson Jacobs has noted, despite supposedly good intentions to showcase Canada's indigenous arts for a world audience, The Spirit Sings drew criticism for the title it was originally given, for the exhibition layout, and especially for its sponsor. The original title for the show, Forget Not My World, Exploring the Canadian Native Heritage, implied that indigenous culture was finished, lost, or at least diminished in the modernity of settler Canada. The design of the exhibition as a journey across Canada from east to west 
replicated the patterns of colonial exploration and settlement. And the major donor to the $2.6 million cost of the exhibition was Shell Canada, who were in dispute with the Lubicon Lake Cree Na Indian Nation about the right to drill on their land. 650 artifacts from 90 museums and private owners across 20 countries had been sought for the exhibition. After protests by the Lubicon Lake Nation, a number of these requests were refused. The Lubicon reported that 30 museums and other lenders withdrew, 20 of them sending letters of protest to the Glenbow and to the Alberta and Canadian governments, while the Glenbow insisted only 12 potential lenders had backed out. Prince Charles is reported to have written to the Alberta government after the Lubicon chief Bernard Om Ominayak asked him to intervene, but the government refused public disclosure on the topic. Tensions around the proposed exhibition only increased with the publication in the Calgary Herald on the 23rd of October 1987 of a cartoon by Vance Rodoart titled Prophecy Over an Ancient Lubicon Campfire. I will not pre reproduce the images here since I, like many of the writers, to the, uh, writers of letters to the newspapers in the days and weeks following the cartoon's publication, find it both racist and incendiary as an intervention in what had been to that point much more of an open public debate on the appropriateness of museums holding indigenous artifacts, especially since in very many cases, routes of acquisition were far from clear. Rodewalt, who is still a cartoonist with the Calgary Herald and who has worked regularly for Marvel Comics, drew a four panel conversation, conversation between a Lubican elder and his grandson. While Rodewalt assigns the elder a derisive version of an argument against the spirit sings, the boy accuses him in sequence of being high, of being drunk, and then in the last frame walks away with a speech bubble that reads, Gramps has flipped out, while the boy's dog says his spirit does not sing. When the show opened at the Glenbow on the 14th of January 1988, First Nations leaders were among the 150 who protested outside the museum. This is a photograph of Alving Wandering Spirit at protest outside the Glenbow Museum, holding a sign that says, share the shame. And you can see a second sign behind it that says, in whose interest does the spirit sing? Uh, while the protest was outside the exhibition on opening night, 2,500 invited guests inside listened to Joe Clark, then foreign affairs minister, give a speech. The first weekend of the Spirit Sing sold out, 3,600 visitors, with 80,000 tickets sold during the Olympic Arts Festival period and 126,000 over its extended run. And I suspect that's still probably the most successful show in terms of ticket sales that the Glenbow has ever, ever mounted. Notably, Mohawk leaders filed an injunction at the Court of Queen's Bench to have several artifacts removed, arguing that these were sacred and not aesthetic objects. Their injunction was upheld on the 15th of January, the day after opening, and the artifacts removed from display and replaced by printed tags that accounted for their absence. A few days earlier, on the 12th of January, First Nations artist Rebecca Belmore staged a performance intervention outside the Thunder Bay Art Gallery that involved her sitting on the ground for two hours on a day when the temperature remained below minus 20. And in this photograph of uh, Belmore's intervention, she is surrounded by a number of signs. The Glenbow Museum presents the Spirit Sings sponsored by Shell. She's wearing um, an, an athlete's bib, but instead of you know, the, the number and the team, it has the Shell logo on it. And she is holding a, a sign in her hand, which is the title of the, um, the performance piece. Artifact 671B, which of course is in line with the, the labeling that was done at the Glenbow Museum. Behind her are about a dozen First Nations students who um, came and stood with her in support, who are also holding the banner that we saw outside the, uh, the same words as we saw outside the Glenbow of Share the Shame. Um, I guess one of the um, tags for the Calgary Olympics was Share the Flame, so it's a riff on that. In a 2012 interview, Belmore commented, and this is a long quotation from Rebecca Belmore, the call issued by the Lubicon Cree Nation to encourage people to respond to the hypocrisy of this supposedly celebratory exhibition and its relationship to the Olympics screamed at me. 
asking people to protest this exhibition in the presence of the Olympic flame was a brilliant idea. I chose the Thunder Bay Art Gallery as a site because it has a collection of First Nations and Inuit art. It made sense to exhibit myself outside such a place. A handful of First Nations students joined me and stood holding a banner that read Share the Shame, while hundreds of Thunder Bay citizens gathered in the presence of the flame at City Hall. This call to action was a significant moment for me. I could not ignore the reality that objects made by our ancestors were vastly more desirable to the world than dealing with our present day existence. One of the outcomes of the Spirit Sings was the formation of Canada's Task Force on Museums and First Peoples, a four-year venture that resulted in, in an agreement that museum curators would, quote, share their exhibition authority with representative communities and with guidelines established for this process. Future exhibitions involving First Nations artifacts would, it was further agreed, ensure increased involvement of Aboriginal peoples in the interpretation of their culture and history by cultural institutions, improved access to museum collections by Aboriginal peoples, and the repatriation of artifacts and human remains from museum collections. The task force acknowledged that Aboriginal peoples own or have moral claim to their heritage, hence they should fully participate in its presentation and in development of policies." End quote. Thus, one legacy of the Spirit Sings has been to reimagine, at least in some North American museums, the representation and interpretation of indigenous cultures, as well as to recognize First Peoples are full partners in the process of design and display. While the exhibition at the Glenbow and the protests it drew were important in raising public awareness about the collection and curation of indigenous cultural materials in museum settings, there are, of course, other issues here, including the nature of corporate sponsorship for the arts at mega events and elsewhere, and most significantly, First Nations land title claims. For the Lubican Lake Nation, a small Cree community in the far north of Alberta, the spirit sings, and particularly its sponsorship by Shell Canada, provided a context in which to bring wide public attention to their long-standing court disputes. Included in Treaty 8, although not signatory to Treaty 8, as the government agents failed to reach the remote location, the Lubican claimed the protection of 10,000 square kilometers of traditional hunting and fishing territory, land that has been exploited illegally by oil and gas company exploration and drilling. This is two maps of, of uh, the Lubican territory. On the uh, map that you're looking at on the left-hand side, shows you how, quite how far north and how remote that territory is. It's um, you know, several hundred kilometers north and east of uh, Grand Prairie. And the map on the right is an illustration of oil and gas wells and pipelines that run through that territory. And you can just get a sense of, of how dense that is. There are um, something like three or 4,000 um, either capped or, or existing um, oil, oil and gas wells there. Um, so in this instance, little has changed for them, for the Lubican Lake Cree Nation, in a quarter of a century since the Games. And the nation still has a number of cases before Canadian courts in an attempt to secure a land title, as well as to address environmental damage. An oil pipeline spill in 2011 on their land was the second largest in Alberta's history. In a letter of congratulations to the Silkwatton Nation on the occasion of their victory this past June at the Supreme Court of Canada in a, in a case against this province, British Columbia, that granted them land title and found the province in breach of its duty to consult with the nation before approving logging licenses. Um, and this is a letter from the Lubican chief that's up on the, on the Lubican Lake website. He observes, quote, by ruling in favor of the Silkwatton Nation, the Supreme Court has ruled that they are primary title holders to their ancestral lands. This means that First Nations interests are paramount and must be considered before those of the provincial government and resource developers. If applied to the Lubican Lake Nation, this decision affirms the position the Lubican Lake Nation has maintained all along. 
1987, the Roderwalk cartoon referenced in one of its panels this, the, the backing of the Lubicon protest by, quote, has-been folk singers for cheap publicity. And almost certainly implied in that comment was Neil Young, perhaps deservedly since he uh, failed to sell his tickets for the proposed uh, Olympic Arts Festival con concert. But more recently, of course, Young's career, like many of his contemporaries, has enjoyed a resurgence and the singer has put his revived popularity to political purpose again with the 2014 Cross Canada Honour the Treaties concerts. And this is one of the advertising posters for those concerts, which is an image of Neil Young staring um, fiercely at the camera and saying, after visiting the Tar Sands, which is the, uh, the large development in the north of Alberta, this is what Neil Young had to say. Fort McMurray looks like Hiroshima. People are dying of cancer because of this. All the First Nations people up there are threatened by this. Young's tour that included a night in Calgary, a sellout night in Calgary this time, and a refusal by Young to meet there with representatives from the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers raised more than half a million dollars in support of the Athabascan Chippewayans First Nations lawsuit against Shell Canada and their expansion of the Jack Pine Mine a project that Young notes that even Ottawa has admitted will likely cause significant adverse environmental effects. Looking back now, the for-profit Calgary Olympics, and especially the Spirit Sings exhibition, might be thought of as a kind of ground zero for the sponsorship of the arts by oil companies. And that's some of the oil companies that donated in 1988. A million dollars from Shell Canada for the Spirit Sings, $400,000 from the Nova Corporation, which is a pipeline company, for the Alberta Theatre Project's Festival of New Playwriting, and Texaco gave $2.5 million to Calgary Opera in 1988. As a kind of ground zero for the sponsorship of the arts by oil companies, who believe their largesse in support of these mega-event occasions will sufficiently greenwash a disgraceful record of environmental degradation. In 1988, Shell was not only the signal sponsor of the Glenbow Museum uh, exhibition, but kept its name in front of Olympic audiences daily. And this was the daily print newspaper that was published every day of the Olympic Games. And as you will see, it is not simply titled Olympic Report, but is in fact Shell Canada's daily Olympic report. And the logos that are on the left and the right of the, of the masthead show you the Shell Canada logo and the Calgary 88 logo as commensurate in size. They're you know, equal in their weighting on there. Um, so it was underwriting the um, uh, print media of the games. Moreover, if Shell's irresponsible con conduct in Alberta's north has been a decades-long reality, we might remember too. BP's attempts to use sponsorship of the London 2012 Olympics and particularly its cultural events to greenwash the recent Deepwater Horizon drilling rig disaster that had killed 11 workers and deposited 200 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. And um, having just been in Louisiana, they're still having huge amounts of oil wash up on their beaches there. And um, BP is also, of course, a major investor in Alberta's tar sands development. In 2012, the London-based Reclaim Shakespeare activist group staged interventions in front of audiences for several cultural Olympiad events, including at the British Museum, the Royal Shakespeare Company Theatres in Stratford, and the Riverside Studios and Hampstead Theatres in London. Uh, they are part of the larger Art Not Oil Coalition, and that coalition was actively protesting BP's sponsorship of last month's Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. And that's just the two logos for, um, for these resistant uh, companies. So I think it's interesting, sort of the appropriation of the logo. And you'll see in the Art Not Oil Coalition logo, it's a kind of series of, of overlaid Xs with the, the nasty black um, oil O in the middle. And the very re, uh, witty Reclaim Shakespeare one that riffs off uh, BP's own logo and sponsorship with a, a kind of Shakespearean quill pen at the end as BP or not BP. Um, in conclusion then, the 1988 Winter Olympics, win win Winter Games were an Olympics of upscaling. Upscaling in duration, in sponsorship and in cultural programming. Its benefits for Canadian sport and for Calgary's self-perception and urban development were and are 
tangible impacts that have been positively felt over the long term. But this, as I hope I've shown here, is only part of the complicated terrain occluded as much as supported by ideas of legacy. What we witness in the example of the Spirit Sings is the appeal of mega events for corporate public relations, where the cultural product serves to support the company's construction of its worthy global citizenship. Since the dollar value of corporate sponsorship grows exponentially, mega event over mega event, the strategy must prove valuable and effective, or at the very least, a good tax write-off. In the context of more recent anti-oil protests, I very much admire the work of Reclaim Shakespeare. They do smart and determined work. And I've argued in a forthcoming essay that their intervention at performances of the Iraqi theater company's remarkable Romeo and Juliet in Baghdad, a commission of the World Shakespeare Festival held, <coughs> excuse me, held as part of the London Cultural Olympiad, opened up for audiences a vital backstory about BP's manip manipulation of the British government's Middle East policies. Um, leaked memos from the uh, time of the first Gulf War show that uh, BP were um, lobbying the, the, the British government to be part of the invasion in order to protect BP's oil fields. And in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, BP was successful in getting through a policy that they are compensated for every day oil does not run through their pipelines in Iraq by the Iraqi taxpayer. It's an extraordinary story. Um, but can this, this kind of resistant work do more than affirm a virtually closed circuit of metropolitan performance that is realized by way of an aesthetic focus? Something that Jody Dean laments as disconnecting politics from the organized struggle. Making politics, she says, into what spectators see. Artistic products, she argues, displace political struggles from the streets to the galleries. From Calgary 1988, I want to remember the importance of Rebecca Belmore's performance in Thunder Bay, deliberately staged outside a gallery. The protest organized outside the Glenbow by the Lubicon Lake Nation and the battles for land and cultural recognition that remain in the Canadian courts. This is a performance topography that insists on citations, that citations of legacy reach far beyond the cities in which mega events with their increasing frequency continue to happen. Thank you. Thank you very much to Susan for that really rich and enjoyable paper and I'd like to add my thanks to the organizers of this event um, and also to all the people who are supporting the event including the signers and interpreters. Um, all right, so my paper is called The Life and Death of Arts in Megacities After Mega... Oh no, that's the title of the conference. My, <laughs> my paper... <laughs> yeah, the whole thing. Uh, my paper is called The After Party, Montreal, Glasgow, London and it's... Um, uh, like Susan's only um, trying to look at the detail of other cities in different context, historical contexts, um, and, but more too many cities, so not such wonderful detail. Um, and just to, and it is also thinking about legacy. So the, the main question of the paper is to ask what mega events leave behind for their city's mm -hmm. arts, which is the overarching question of this conference. And to summarize the kinds of questions that that enables are the kinds of things we've been asking over the last several days. So do mega events bestow extraordinary opportunity in a scene bursting with new resources, jobs, initiatives, infrastructures, inspirations and audiences, not to mention regenerated neighborhoods, revived economies, you know, enlightened ways of thinking, um, emotionally affective, wonderful feeling, all kinds of things like that? 
On the other hand, do mega events burden the future by leaving barren wastelands, all resources spent, artistic hinterlands beyond the cities sucked dry by the financial voraciousness of the metropolitan event, audiences and artists exhausted and disillusioned, uh, strangulating debts accumulated, corruption rewarded, would-be resources turning rapidly into white elephants, and, as we've been hearing, neoliberal economies deeply embedded, leading to ever-worsening social inequality. Clearly, that's a little bit lopsided and a little bit black and white, so possibly we get uh, ver varieties of both of those things together, some combination of those two scenarios. So that's the main question I want to ask, and equally importantly, I want to ask, what are the social legacies of mega, event mega arts events? Who celebrates at mega events after parties and who's not invited? How can mega events legacies be supported to ensure that arts flourish and social development is sustained? This presentation aims to offer an admittedly slightly whirlwind um, comparative analysis of mega events, short and longer term legacies for the arts and culture, principally in two cities, Montreal after the 1976 Olympics, which Susan has referred to, and Glasgow, not after the Commonwealth Games of a month ago, but after its year as European City of Culture in 1990. And I'll conclude by thinking somewhat speculatively about London after the Olympic and Paralympic Games and Cultural Olympiad of 2012. I've chosen these three cities partly because I've lived in each of them, I know them, and I particularly care about them, partly because they demonstrate historical range, as well as two different kinds of mega events, Olympic contexts, and a year as European City of Culture, and partly, finally, because the examples of Montreal and Glasgow are widely seen as urban mega events that were respectively a pro prototypical failure, in the case of Montreal, and a poster child success in the, in the case of Glasgow 1990. And I want to interrogate those conclusions, and I also want to reflect on those examples to consider how, so soon after London 2012, not to mention Vancouver 2010, we might influence the legacies of those more recent events to help to realize their more positive outcomes. So to begin with Montreal. Montreal, just to step back before 1976, famously hosted the International Exposition Expo 67 in 1967 to widespread approval and, appre and appreciation. It was reportedly the best attended expo to that date and it featured innovative design, which is still admired including uh, Buxman, the geodesic dome of the American Pavilion designed by Buckminster Fuller, which is now the Montreal Biosphere. And I'm showing a slide of that. Um, and it's a biosphere, and uh, it resembles the biosphere that's here in Vancouver as well, in the Olympic Village. Another famous icon from Expo 67 is Moshi Safdie's famous cubist housing development, Habitat 67, which I'm showing an image of now. Cubist blocks of housing, um, and in this design, um, which are still present in Montreal and are one of the most famous legacies of Expo 67. So Expo 67 was considered to be hugely successful. The 1976 Montreal Olympics, less than a decade later, and masterminded by the same powerful mayor, Jean Drapeau, are widely remembered as much less successful, even according to a summary of the literature in the International Journal of the History of Sport from 2010, quote, the perfect model of post-Olympic failure, end quote. Most famously catastrophic uh, were the Olympic Stadium and the event's long-standing and massive debts. The stadium, which Susan has also already referred to, was designed by French architect Roger Tachibert and was nicknamed the Big O for its shape and for the Olympics. Um, and I'm showing it here as it might be familiar to you um, with its leaning tower and retractable roof uh, recognizable part of the Montreal skyline. However, due to labor strikes, political wrangling, and apparently quite serious mismanagement, the stadium was unfinished before the games, with the main bu building functional, as we saw in uh, slides that Janice showed um, yesterday, but neither the planned retractable roof nor its iconic leaning tower complete. So in fact, it just was a, a, the Olympic O um, when it when it opened in 1976, it had no roof and it had no tower. The tower, as Susan has mentioned, was only finally, well, I think you referred to the debt. The tower was only finally completed in 1987, so 11 years later, and the roof not until 1988, though parts of the roof, roof collapsed famously in 1991 and 1999. Um, so due to those initial delays, plus likely corruption and some widely acknowledged extravagance, the stadium's costs rapidly expanded 
so that it soon became known as the big O, O-W-E, ha ha, get it, <laughs> rather than O, so <laughs> owing, owing money. Ultimately, the stadium cost, as again Susan has mentioned, three times what was originally planned and is a notorious white elephant, having failed to attract and, retrained and, and retrain, retain any income-generating tenant following the departure to another Montreal ground of the North American, fo- that is North American football, as opposed to football, um, following the departure to another Montreal ground of the North American football team, the Montreal Alouettes, in 1998, they moved to Molson Stadium, and the migration of the Montreal Expos, named after Expo 67, um, who went to Washington in 2004 and were renamed the Nationals. So instead of being an iconic Montreal team, an iconic Washington team. So the, the stadium has no um, permanent tenant and so no regular income generation. So it's widely considered to be an economic as well as, um, in many respects, an architectural disaster. Perhaps even more of a disaster than the stadium was the overall debt left by the entirety of the Montreal Olympics. When he won the Games for Montreal, Mayor Drapeau boasted that, quote, the Olympics can no more lose money than a man can have a baby, end quote. Unsurprisingly to many, the phrase would come back to haunt him. Um, And and, uh, I'll refer to that later. Um, forecast in 1970 to cost um, a mere $310 million. The eventual bill for the game, as Susan has noted, was $1.5 billion. A sum, as she said, that wouldn't be paid off for another 30 years until 2006. And to kind of put that in context, that's seven subsequent Summer Olympics that have passed before Montreal pays off that debt. And Quebec City, not Quebec City, Montreal and the province of Quebec because Quebec ended on taking over in many respects. So the stadium and the debt are the Montreal Olympics' iconic failures. But what, about Mon- what did Montreal 1976 do or not do for the arts? The arts, um, and Susan has m- much greater detail about Calgary in 1988. I'm afraid I haven't been able to generate that kind of detail, but I'll tell you what I have been able to find. The arts have had some profile in the Olympics ever since their modern revival in 1912. But the larger scale cultural Olympiad didn't become common until, I believe, the Sydney Games in 2000. Likewise, highly theatricalized opening ceremonies um, mostly post-date Montreal 76, um, becoming more established with the 1980 Moscow Games. So before that, they were more protocol-led with aspects of performance. Even so, it looks as though the profile of the arts around the Montreal 76 Olympics was very modest. Descriptions of the comparatively small-scale and protocol-led opening ceremony refer to dancing by three troops, one Bavarian, and the other two, perhaps predictably, Canadian and Quebecois, not the same, two different ones. Along some, some gym, alongside some gymnastics and some singing, nothing like the scale of event that we're used to now. The apparently ubiquitous mega event a- analyst Beatrice Garcia, who's also written about the London, London 2012 and also Glasgow 1990, as well as every other mega event I've come across, records that, quote, Montreal 1976 presented a small scale but highly popular spontaneous arts festival with a marked national character, end quote, but she doesn't go into detail. Reportedly, however, the core artistic component of the Montreal 76 Olympics was supposed to have been uh, corrida, or corridart, uh, so a kind of pun on corridor and art, a two-day durational installation of artworks along six kilometers of one of Montreal's main east-west arteries, Sherbrooke Street. Sadly, the event was apparently called off by Drapeau two days before the Olympics began, leading leading not only to the lack of the event, but also to legal battles with some of its um, would-be artists. Um, And we saw in Janice's uh, presentation the other day um, elements of the closing ceremony, um, which, as you may remember, had um, sort of stylized native dancing around um, teepees, illuminated teepees in the Olympic colors. So we know there was artistic representation, but some of it um, quite... uh, sort of grotesque in certain ways. However, finally, an important artistic legacy of the games could have been elements of the architecture, but this has not been fully realized. For example, for my friend Aaron Pollard, who's one and a half of Montreal-based queer transdisciplinary transdisciplinary performance company, Two Boys TV, the Velodrome was, quote, arguably the most architecturally significant building on the site, end quote, but it has been radically altered and turned into an indoor zoo, the Biodome, which, as he says, is replete with tropical birds whose wings have been clipped. 
So alongside its epic debt and white elephant O, there's a strong line of failure emerging in the Montreal 76 Olympics relationship to the arts as well. But that's not the whole story. <clears throat> in an address to the Canadian Olympic Association in 1996, former member of the Montreal Olympics organizing committee, Michel Gay, admitted his, investment in, admitted his own investment in celebrating the Games' achievement and claimed that they had contributed to the founding of both the École Nationale du Cirque, the National Circus School, in 1976, and what would become one of Quebec's most successful companies overall, not to mention one of its most successful arts companies, the Cirque du Soleil, which Susan has mentioned, and which was founded in 1984. So significantly, some, um, he links the, uh, the development of the École Nationale du Cirque with the preparation for the Montreal Olympics, um, gym gymnastics athletes, um, and then uh, people who are directly involved in the Cirque du Soleil. Other observers credit the 76th Olympics, often in concert with Expo 67, with lifting Montreal out of relative obscurity and, anomal and anomalousness as a comparatively small, francophone, and Canadian city, um, so like, whoa, what's that in North America, right? Um, into the quote, the ranks of the world's best known cities. Um, and a, a longer analysis would have to try to evaluate the relative influence of six, Expo 67, Montreal 76, alongside other um, contem contemporaneous influences on Montreal's global status, such as um, would-be hipster, Michel Tr um, or rather uh, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, um, his, his you know, beautiful wife, um, glamorous wife, Margaret Trudeau, and the much bigger context of what's known as Quebec's quiet revolution, which involved the loosening of the grip of Catholicism, increasing global migration, and all kinds of other social changes, which radically changed Quebec society in that era. But we could definitely see these major events as contributing to that change. The final point I'd like I'd add um, to a list of ways the Montreal 76 Olympics were good for the arts is their role as a source of satire. So perhaps linking to some of the points that David was making about interruption um, in relation to more recent Olympics. So their, so their role as a source of satire, not least for Terry Mosher, um, whose other name is As Aislin, who's a longtime cartoonist for the Montreal newspaper, The Gazette. In response to Drapeau's boast, Mayor Jean Drapeau's boast, that it would be as unlikely for an Olympics to lose money as for a man to get pregnant, he drew an apparently pregnant Drapeau um, phoning the well-known Montreal-based pro-choice advocate, doctor and abortion provider, Henry Morgenthaler. Um, so I'm showing a slide of um, a pregnant, well, a pregnant-looking drapeau with his hand on his belly. He's naked. He has a little tiny Olympic rings covering his modesty. And uh, he's got a signature glasses on, and he's on the phone. He says, hello, Morgenthaler. And, um, and, and, um, and underneath is the quotation where he said it, it would be just as difficult for, a man, or for the Olympics to lose money as it would be for a man to get pregnant. Um, Aislinn did many other cartoons at the expense of the Olympics. Um, so now I'm showing a slide, uh, Montreal 1976 Olympics, I'm showing a slide of four cartoons. In the first one, um, Drapeau, the mayor, is um, kind of, uh, he's got one, he's, got, he's holding the five Olympic rings, one is around his neck, um, he's treading on another one. He looks like a, a not very competent hula hoop artist. Um, second one shows a weightlifter um, who's holding what is uh, portrayed as Montreal's Olympic debt and where he's, he's counting how long he's been holding it and he's counting off the years. And when he comes to 1980, uh, what is it, 1986, he says, uh, happy birthday champion, because it's 10 years of debt. Um, and the fourth image, um, there's a mock book cover which is, uh, which is a, it's called IOU, La Vraie Histoire des Jeux Olympiques, The True History of the Montreal Olympics, IOU. So he had a lot of fun at the expense of the Olympics, but he especially had fun with the Olympic Stadium. Um, so now I'm showing a slide of, again, four of his cartoons. Um, the first one, which imagines all, um, tops for the uh, unfinished uh, stadium, so because the stadium had no roof, he imagines it with a toque, uh, like a famous you know, Canadian knitted hat, um, with a Big Mac hamburger, I think, um, and various things like that. Uh, oh, and I didn't refer to, I'm just gonna go back to a previous slide, because I didn't refer to a, one of the slides in the previous image, which shows um, would-be athletes carrying what would-be flags for nations, but instead they're um, brand names like Coke um, and uh, Tilden. Um, so I, I think that one's interesting in the context of what we've been talking about in terms of the um, uh, corporate, corporatization of the Olympics. So to come back to my next slide where he's ridiculing um, the stadium, 
first slide shows a variety of possible um, hats for the roof, including an igloo and a teepee and uh, a Big Mac. Um, a second slide shows a bomber going over the Olymp Olympic Stadium to bomb it to make it the world's biggest sk outdoor skating rink, so let's just obliterate it and have a skating rink instead. A third one shows an aerial view which, which set, reveals that actually the Olympic Stadium does look like a white elephant from above. And the final and most recent one sh um, of this selection shows the Olympic Stadium simply turned into, the O turned into a lifesaver um, that you would use for um, somebody who's drowning. And it just says, instead of SOS, it turns that into Scuttle Olympic, or uh, I can't read it, Save Olympic Stadium, but Scuttle Olympic Stadium is what he's written. <coughs> Um, so, Masha ridiculed the failure of the, of the stadium, but what this also draws attention to is the failure of Montreal 76 to, quote, regenerate its comparatively poor East End Montreal neighborhood. Such urban regeneration was much less prioritized in mega events practiced before around 1990. However, this failure is a double-edged sword in this context. The event, the event didn't raise the neighborhood and its residents out of some levels of poverty, but nor did it gentrify um, and effectively evict those residents, as we've seen happening in Vancouver's Olympic Village in its East End. So in that sense, I don't think it effectively colonized in the ways that um, Heather was discussing yesterday. I think the colonization of that part of uh, Montreal failed. So to summarize, Montreal's 1976 Olympics did burden the city and province with debt, did produce a white elephant stadium, and did place the arts at a very low, even irrelevant priority. However, they did also pr provoke some fierce satire, um, interrupting assumptions about the value of the games, and they did not gentrify their neighborhood. However, I'd say that those make for um, a silver lining that is admittedly small, perhaps even transparent, given the size and the leadenness of the thundercloud that is generally perceived to be Montreal 76. To move on to Glasgow. In contrast to Montreal 76, Glasgow's year as European city of culture in 1990 is routinely lauded as successful and beneficial for Glasgow. The Euro just to contextualize this, the European Capitals of Culture scheme was launched in 1985 with Athens and with the cultural aims of, quote, highlighting the richness and diversity of cultures in Europe, while nevertheless, quote, celebrating the cultural features Europeans share and increasing European citizens' sense of belonging to a common cultural area and fostering the contribution of culture to the development of cities. Cultural ambitions aside, the European Commission recognizes and even boasts about the economic benefits of being the city of culture, writing, quote, experience has shown that the event is an excellent opportunity for regenerating cities, raising the international profile cities, and boosting tourism, along the lines promoted by Richard Florida, as we've been hearing throughout this conference. So as Beatrice Garcia, again, and her collaborator in this context, Tamsin Cox, have put it, the European City um, or Capital of Culture program, quote, has become a key platform for city positioning and a catalyst for economic and cultural regeneration, end quote. Such catalyzing and positioning is certainly what the City of Culture is seen to have done for Glasgow by many observers. According to another City of Culture analyst, Louise C. Johnson, before 1990, quote, the image and reality of Glasgow was as a blighted, abandoned industrial landscape, riddled with mean streets and social disadvantage, end quote. And for the record, I don't entirely agree with Johnson, and I'd note that she's neither Glaswegian, Scottish, or British, um, and only visited, visited Glasgow after 1990. Uh, so I don't entirely agree with her, but however, it was, there's no question that Glasgow was an industrial city that, went, that had a massive post-industrial decline. After 1990, quote, almost all residents agreed that the 1990 program improved the public image of Glasgow, end quote. And that's a quote from a Glasgow City Council publication um, drawing on uh, statistical evidence drawn together by John Myerscough, who's an influential uh, statistician in relation to um, the economics of the arts in the UK. And that the change that was perceived about Glasgow was not only affective but also material. material catalyzing Glasgow's rebranding and creative industries to such an extent that by 2011, it had become, quote, the largest concentration of the creative economy in the UK outside London, which is, um, might be surprising considering its size. Um, and, you know, we might think of perhaps maybe Manchester would be bigger, Edinburgh, which, you know, has the festivals, um, but it's actually Glasgow. So I'll come back to consider this change in urban, urban profile and industry as disadvantageous later. But to continue with some of the advantages for Glasgow of 1990, the year also developed um, Glasgow's arts infrastructures, including for visual art, the McLennan Galleries, 
For music, the massive Royal Concert Hall at the junction of Buchanan and Saki Hall Streets. Um, and for theater, a new expanded lobby for the Citizens Theater um, and the invention of the massive and often glorious tramway, which has hosted some extraordinary um, art uh, performances, especially, but also uh, exhibitions. 1990 also brought an extraordinary range of international artists to Glasgow in comparison perhaps to uh, both Vancouver as we've seen and also Calgary in 88. Um, so for my friend and colleague, site responsive artist Dr. Minty Donald, um, who was in Glasgow in 1990, um, that range of um, international artists who came to Glasgow vastly extended the range of Glasgow artists' knowledge and also the scale of their ambitions, I think she was implying. So the roll call of international um, companies and artists who performed in Glasgow that year is extraordinary. Despite the fact that not only was Glasgow reputedly, quote, blighted and abandoned, uh, to refer to my early quotation, but also relatively small with only 600,000 inhabitants or 2 million in the greater conurbation, so smaller than Calgary in 88. International performing visitors in 1990 included Frank Sinatra, Luciano Pavarotti, that's how you heard him pronounce when he's there, Pavarotti. Um, <laughs> Peter Brooks Theatre Company with La Tempette. It's interesting to see how many it could go to the same, yeah. But um, also New York's Worcester Group with LSD, just the high points, um, and the Worcester Group came back subsequently to Glasgow. The Bolshoi, Bolshoi Ballet, um, Anna Teresa de Kirsmacher's Dance Company, the Netherlands uh, Dance Theatre 2, the Mali Drama Theatre, um, Sankai Juku, um, Stockholm's Dramatin, Robert Lepage with the epic tectonic plates. Um, Scottish and British artists and companies made major contributions too. Uh, Bill Bryden presented the massive site responsive show, The Ship in Glasgow's Shipyards, and I would have loved to see this next show. Robbie Coltrane starred as, as Dario Fo's Mr. Obufo. Um, DV8 Physical Theatre had a residency in the city, and there were other big shows by the Royal Shakespeare Company, the Clyde Unity, and Citizens Theatre, as well as masses of community-based performance. Audiences, too, were um, reportedly developed. Um, apparently, quote, four out of five adults in the region were touched, end quote, by the Year of Culture program, <laughs> which is clearly like a really amorphous <laughs> verb for what happened to them. They accidentally went in and used the toilet and came out again or something, I don't know. Um, so, uh, so as in Montreal 76, Glasgow 1990 provoked some healthy satire, especially through the activities of Workers' City, a group of about 40 left-leaning artists and defenders of working class culture, such as writer and visual artist, who I think is amazing, Alistair Gray, the uh, poet Tom Leonard, who normally writes in the Glasgow vernacular, and the Booker Prize winning novelist James Kelman. Workers' City organized opposition marches and meetings, agitated in the press, and created a poster campaign. Um, the campaign appropriated Glasgow 1990's own appropriation of the famous early 20th century artist Charles Rennie Mackintosh. Um, and so he's, he and his contemporaries were known for a font um, which is kind of linear and elegant and is reflected in the um, design of furniture that he did and also in his visual artwork. Um, and so the first image that I'm showing, I'm showing three images of posters. The first is a Glasgow 1990 promotional poster and it says, there's a lot glass going on in 1990, <laughs> cultural capital of Europe. And the font is this one that um, uh, summons the idea of the elegance of Charles Rennie Mackintosh's work. Um, the second poster is by Workers City, and it says there's a lot of con going on in 1990. So instead of glass going on, it's con going on. And the final image shows um, a character who looks a bit like... Um, a, uh, somebody from Monopoly, on a Monopoly board, with his, uh, he's wearing a black suit and he's um, pulling the pocket, his pockets out and his pockets are empty. And it just says Glasgow 1991. So and again, it's with the same font. Um, and the, so the idea is that Glasgow 1990 is going to bankrupt Glasgow. So the campaign, um, the campaign of the work of Workers City made the case that the year, quote, had more to do with capital than culture. Um, that in a bid to represent Glasgow in a positive light, the reality of working class life and cultural heritage was ignored and trashed. Events brought no econo economic benefit to the average citizen, and the whole package confirmed the willingness of the Labour Council to partner with and even more systematically advantage capital over labour, end quote. In other words, Workers' City made the main case against the European City Capital of Culture year arguing that it diver diverted resources away from more important routes to social welfare and that it as assisted external capital investment with little local benefit, no local commitment, and therefore no long-term stability. 
So I wanted to explore the ways Montreal and Glasgow were both successful and unsuccessful in their respective mega events years, largely to interrogate the dominant and widely accepted narratives that circulate around them. But I was struck in my conversations with local artists whom I respect in both cities that they both broadly agreed with those dominant narratives. My Montreal informants were exasperated with the grand failure of Montreal 76, with its squandering of resources and its ongoing mismanagement. And my Glasgow 1990 informants, though not blind to aspects of, a, um, of the year as a somewhat tacky and problematic branding exercise, were genuinely appreciative of the artistic and employment, op employment opportunities that the year afforded. So one of my friends said, you know, I think I earned the most money ever in my whole life in 1990. Um, so, I mean, and clearly as an artist, a year of, uh, of rich um, income is helpful for a longer term uh, subsidy of one's own art practice. My own reflections on those cities' experiences have helped me to think about what can and should come out of London 2012. Resource planning and management is one thing, and as Michael McKinney, and Neville Gaby, and Kristen Farquhar have pointed out, affordable housing in particular is at risk. On a brighter note, um, one thing we've already seen is in the work of such artists as Laura Oldfield Ford and Ian Sinclair and David Pinder's um, presentation um, is that critical satire, commentary, and reflection um, on the localized risks of such mega events is part of what um, seems to inevitably come out of these events. And especially as mega events are increasingly instrumentalized to deliver urban regeneration through inward investment, we need to advocate for the interests of local people, especially the less advantaged local, less advantaged local people who are at risk of the discriminatory housing and welfare policies that the UK's conservative liberal democrat coalition government is implementing. Um, and there are draconian implement, um, legislations that even the conservative London mayor, Boris Johnson, has recognized will lead to, quote, London's ethnic cleansing. Um, and we also need to reflect on, uh, as we've had our attention drawn to over the last couple of days, um, the longer term uh, legacies, especially of the massively powerful effects for disability and deaf arts and culture um, that we saw in London 2012. For me, one of the wondrous aspects of the 2012 Cultural Olympiad was its intentional and vast scale and diversity. So that's part of what it aimed for, was lots and lots of stuff and at an um, a kind of extraordinary scale. And for me, that allowed for so much artistic variety in so many different places and for so many different audiences. And that was one of the, those were some of the great benefits. That kind of scale and diversity, however, is jeopardized in the face of arts funding cuts introduced by the current UK government in 2010. And those cuts have already accumulated to become direct cuts to arts organizations of approximately 20% at least in national arts funding by 2018. So in other words, part of what we've been thinking about over the last couple of days is the, um, is the massive pumping in of funding to the arts in the context of mega events. And then as um, Duncan Lowe pointed out a few days ago, the ways that those tend to taper off after mega events. And in the current political context in the UK, with more and more cuts to the arts, I think that there's a greater risk that the tail, the, the tail off will be deeper um, than it might otherwise be. Um, finally, London 2012's ambition, as put in one of its slogans, was to be a, quote, once in a lifetime event. And though I appreciate that slogan's emphasis on the wonderful and, an extra, and the extraordinary, it risks inhibiting expectations about legacy and even development if it's only once in a lifetime. Why, I wonder, not wish for and make the profile of arts in London that we had in London 2012, and not just in London, but throughout the UK, not once in a lifetime, but a way of life. Thank you.